was infatuated with this thing as soon as I saw it. Like as soon as I was able to get on this computer, I just fell in love with computers. Specifically, I loved making things with computers. I realized you could create with even something as simple as a, this Commodore VIC-20. Uh, this is one of the first things I ever made. And all I'm asking it to do is print hello, protohack, and then it prints hello, protohack. Now, that might not seem that impressive to you. But when I was a kid, I was like, oh my god, this is amazing. Loved it. And uh, I just kept uh, getting into computers. I became a serious computer nerd. Um, let's do a little audience participation. Any of you guys have a phone with internet access? <laughs> OK, I want you to go to Google, and I want you to search nerd mullet. And go to images, if there's no images. Who's got nerd mullet up? This is me in grade nine, for real. I was really into computers. Was that actually you? That's actually me. You're the first image on Google. I'm the number one search result for a nerd mullet. <laughs> and uh, I was so into computers that around my 10th or 11th birthday, I asked my parents to give me a copy of Turbo Pascal 6.0 as a birthday present. And uh, this is a programming language in IDE. Is anyone, anyone familiar with Turbo Pascal? All right. It was right around when object-oriented programming was getting big, and I was hearing people talk about it. And I wanted to get into it. I wanted to make programs the way that I saw other people making programs. So I got my copy of Turbo Pascal, a big manual like this big, a box full of diskettes, and I just dove in. And I discovered something about myself. I'm a computer geek who can't code. And this has been reinforced over and over and over again my entire life. I've had every opportunity to learn how to code. I started using computers when I was five, when it was really rare. And I've had all these opportunities. I had manuals. I could have taught myself. And I just can't code. It's just a truth about myself. But you know, after that, with that thing with Turbo Pascal, I started looking for other ways to make things with computers. Because I loved computers. I was on the computer every day. And I really wanted to create things. And I started to find things. Uh, at school, I discovered this program on the Macs called HyperCard. This thing was amazing. It allowed you to create visual layouts with buttons and link them to other screens. Any of you play with HyperCard ever? I must be way older than all of you. <laughs> it's amazing. It's fun, though, isn't it? It's really fun. And I was on a PC, and so I wanted to find the PC equivalent, and I found this thing called Macromedia Author. Uh, Macromedia had all these products that were for people who couldn't code but wanted to create things for computers. And Adobe ended up buying a lot of their products. Oh, and this. Anybody know what this is? Microsoft Access. For my next birthday, I begged my parents to give us a copy of Microsoft Office Professional because I wanted Microsoft Access so bad. It's a database program, but it had a visual uh, layout builder. And you could connect the fields and the inputs that you made in these screens to tables in a database, all without code. And I would use this for hours and hours. In fact, the first product I ever made was a Microsoft Access database that I burned onto a bunch of CD-ROMs, and I took to a trade show and sold for $20. Guess how much? I made $20. <laughs> I sold one copy. Oh, and then this happened. 1993, I'm 13 years old. The Mosaic web browser comes out. And this blew my mind. The idea that you could make this with this was incredible to me. Because HTML was a scripting language, but it was accessible. Like anybody could figure it out. It was like real super easy. H1 is a heading, P is a paragraph. And the idea that a nerdy kid in Stony Plain, Alberta could publish something on the web and have it seen by people around the world blew my mind. In fact, that idea still blows my mind. 
My kids don't really get it, but to me, I was like, this is incredible. I can't believe this is possible. All of this is to say, I love making things with computers. And I'm still making things to this day. This is my podcast. It's called Mega Maker. And uh, this is something I'm just doing for fun. I speak into a microphone. It goes into my computer. I can edit it in GarageBand. I can put those MP3 files into an RSS feed that then syndicates it around the world. That blows my mind. There's people from all around, there's people from all of your countries listening to this show. It's insane. So sometimes, some things I make for fun, some things I make for money now. This is a project I just launched last week. So, can you make stuff on computers if you don't know how to code? Hell yeah! But this is an entrepreneurial uh, event. Like it says right on the thing, this is like for entrepreneurs. So I guess the real question is, can you make a product if you don't know how to code? Hell yeah! But first, you need to understand a fundamental truth about products. If you're going to remember anything from this talk, if you're going to take a note, even if you have to write it on your phone, this is what you want to write down. This is the most important thing about products. It's taken me 10 years to learn this. People use products for one reason only. I only see a few people writing this down. This is going to change your life. People use products for one reason only, to make their lives better. That's the only reason people use products. And the fundamental mistake people make, whether they can code or not code, whether they're making a prototype or not, is they miss this point. People only use products for one reason, to make their lives better. See, everyone wants to make progress in their current situation. So if you have a dumpy little apartment, you want a better apartment. If you have a crappy, broken down car, you want a better car. If you have a, a sick dog, you want a, a healthy dog. OK, that's a bad example. But uh, here, here's a better example. Apple iPod. How does this make people's lives better? Well, let me take all of my music with me so I have something to do on the bus. Because before, if you were on a long bus ride, you only had your Sony Discman, and that only had 12 songs on it, right? And that wasn't good enough for the whole bus trip. You give me my whole music collection, let me take my whole music collection with me, that's good for like 10 bus trips, right? How does it make your life better? Gives me something to do on the bus. Uh, here's another way to think about it. People hire products to do jobs in their lives. Just like you would hire someone to you know, do a job for you, it's like, Apple iPod, entertain me on the bus. That's what I'm hiring you for. Here's another example. MailChimp. How does this make people's lives better? Help me to send better email so that I can sell more stuff. So think about this with real human beings. You got a business owner over here. This is where they are. They want to go over there. What do they want to do? They want to sell more stuff. And there's some whys for that. Ever heard of the five whys? Any of you guys use that? It's a way to find the root cause of anything. So why do you want to sell more stuff? So I can have more revenue. Why do you want more revenue? So I can have more profit. Why do you want more profit? So I can make a living, right? Why do you want to make a living? Well, you know, that's the root cause, right? So your idea, whatever it is, you all have ideas. I have ideas. I wake up at 2 in the morning with ideas. But your idea has to help people make progress in their lives, or they won't care about it. And the biggest mistake people make usually isn't coding their app the wrong way or making their app the wrong way. It's working on the wrong idea. So you have to build something that people want. It's harder than it sounds. How do we do that? So I'm going to explain how we do that. Step one, and this is what's worked for me. Maybe it, it might not work for everybody. This, this is what's worked for me. First, focus on a specific group of people. 
So why do you need to focus on a specific group of people? If the whole purpose of your app or your product or whatever you're building is to help people, how are you going to help people if you don't know who the hell you're helping? Who is this person? Oh, it's just for people on the internet. Like, that's not enough, right? You need to know who you're helping so you know how to help them. So here's some examples. Parents with kids in diapers, folks starting a podcast, freelance designers, F-sharp developers, 40-plus joggers, commuters. I just pulled these out of my head. These are just ideas of groups you could focus on, right? A lot of you are still young. But one trick for figuring this out as you move through life is to say, what group is already paying you for your time and expertise? Or uh, it's not as good, but what questions do people always ask me? Right? So um, sorry, what's your name? Uh, you that were talking about the music mastering? Dominic. So if everybody in the school goes to Dominic for recording advice, that's a pretty good idea of maybe the group you should be focusing on. Who should, I, who should Dominic focus on? Is that true? No? If they knew about you, right? Maybe if you had a podcast, Dominic. Um, but uh, where was I going to this? Oh, so your group could be people that want to get into audio engineering. High school students that want to get into audio engineering. That's a, that's a group, right? So here's an example. My friend Francois had a consulting business where he served Shopify store owners, right? Awesome. Do any of you guys do consulting on the side or like little projects on the side, side, side hustle? You guys have a side hustle? OK. Anyone want to share what the, what's your side hustle? Airbnb. <laughs> Airbnb, OK. Anyone else? Uh, digital marketing services. Digital marketing services, cool. I'm with them. OK. So something like digital marketing services, Awesome. Actually, all of you should start a side hustle. When you go home, start something. Start trying to get people to pay you money for a service that you provide. And the reason is, you guys get to meet with clients all the time. You get to sit across from them, and you get to ask them questions. So where are you at right now? Oh, this is where I'm at. Where do you want to go? Ah, oh, we want more leads. We want more. What? Oh, what stands in your way? What are the obstacles? You write down all of these observations, and those observations turn into products. That's what uh, Francois did. This idea to me is the stupidest idea in the world. This is what it does, all right? This is what it does. It takes uh, a store's Instagram account, and it just creates a gallery on their Shopify store and makes it shoppable. It seems stupid to me, because why would you replicate the Instagram thing? It, it just, it's a weird product to me. And it's going gangbusters. He was able to quit all of his other consulting work and focus just on this. It's growing really fast. But the reason, to, to me it's a dumb idea, but to him it made sense, because he was sitting across those clients every day. They're like, listen, we really want an Instagram, shoppable Instagram gallery. OK, so step number two is this, the, the step everyone wants to skip. It's do your research. And the way I try to explain this is you get that group of people Dominic, it's uh, high school students that want to get into audio engineering. You've got to research these people the same way a biologist would observe a lion in the savanna. Just like you're just kind of, so Dominic, I mean, this might be kind of creepy, but you're just like kind of sitting back and you're just like taking notes every time someone asks you about audio engineering. And then maybe you're like, watching people use GarageBand or something and the mistakes they make. And you're, oh, man, everyone gets stuck on trimming audio clips. OK, wow, everyone has their audio levels wrong. You're just writing these things down. Observations. And you're just observing. It's best to observe people in their habitat. This is why it makes sense to focus on a group that you're already kind of around, right? So if you're with a client, it's best to meet them in their office. So here's an example. This guy asked me a question. He's like, how? I'm, I have an online uh, jewelry store, but how do I figure out marketing for online jewelry, for luxury jewelry? And I'm like, you got to get out of the building. So I took my phone, and I recorded a video of myself walking to the jewelry store in disguise. I had sunglasses on. <laughs> 
And then I walked into the jewelry store and I put the phone down and I just watched people buy jewelry. Right? This is on YouTube, you can find it. YouTube.com slash Justin Jackson. And what do I observe? 90% of the products in the jewelry store are for women. 100% of the people in the jewelry store were men. 100% of the purchases were men, men buying jewelry for women. And all those, women, all those men look nervous as hell. <laughs> right? They don't want to be in there. They're like walking around. It's like they, they don't know what to get. And like, you know, so I just watched people buying jewelry. What did they buy? What are they buying it for? What you want to figure out is the answers to those questions I said before. Write these down if you're taking notes. Because these, it took me forever to figure this out. And they're so simple, but it's just, where are they now? Where do they want to go? And what obstacles stand in their way? That's every single product. Here's how we can communicate it visually. There's your customer. Where are they now? Well, I'm a boyfriend, and uh, I've been dating this gal for three years. OK, where do you want to go? Well, I want to be the romantic boyfriend, right? That's my dream. I want to be, I want her to <laughs> love me, right? What stands in your way? Uh, I don't know shit about romance or jewelry, right? That, that's the obstacle. And then your job as a product person is to help them overcome those obstacles and get to the dream of a better life. That's what product people do, right? Oh, the other way of it is to think about their dream is the superpower they want, right? What's the superpower they want? Well, I want to be the romantic boyfriend. What are you right now? Well, I'm a dipshit. You know, I want to get there, right? <laughs> Step three is to create a hypothesis, right? So our hypothesis could be free me from the anxiety of wondering what to get my girlfriend so I can be an impressive romantic boyfriend, right? That's our hypothesis. And I mean, this was me observing people for five minutes. You would have to do this every day for a long time, right? But I think my hypothesis is pretty close because the jewelry industry is already targeting marketing towards that struggle, right? Um, jewelry gift guide for your girlfriend, right? Number four, test your hypothesis by building the tiniest product possible. So I think, and this is a little bit different because you guys are going to be making prototypes and things like that, but I think, for example, Dominic's first step, what's the tiniest thing he could do? Well, it doesn't involve code at all. It could just be him saying, uh, you send me your MP3 files and I will master them for you. 